Hey, happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Uh, banana plants aren't doing well, just so you know. So, uh, lots going on in Washington, I'm sure you're aware of that. And uh, Senator Bill Cassidy, uh, who's a physician on the uh, committee that is reviewing the director of HHS, said a really interesting thing. He said he spent his whole career having people uh, giving families trust in vaccines. So, I thought it'd be fun just because it's who I am, to kind of review some of the data of why vaccines have been effective, particularly recently. Uh, but before I do that, I think it's important to look at, uh, you know, we are at a five-year anniversary for COVID. I mean, we all started this in January, uh, five years ago, and uh, almost five years to the day that uh, COVID-19 was considered uh, a public health emergency in the United States. And if you look back, Pat, the past five years, there have been 7 million deaths worldwide and 1.2 million in the United States alone. Uh, now, you may think it's all past and everything's great. Well, last, just past January, this, just this past month, there were 2,100 reported deaths related to COVID. Uh, and there, you know, with all the vaccines available, it, there only 25% of adults have been up to date on their vaccine. So, by not being uh, rigorous on your vaccine, keeping up to date, there, there continues to be deaths. And so 2,000 a month translate to 24,000 a year. That's a, that's a bad flu season. So it's still around, it's still, still a problem. I, I thought I'd go show you the data for how bad it was because it really says a lot. This was the surge in Omicron uh, in October of 2021. The red line is deaths from unvaccinated people the green line is just with one dose of vaccine. Uh, and then the, the blue line is bivalent booster. And early on, you know, the virus was very virulent. People were not really had immunity to it. And almost all the deaths were due to people who were unvaccinated. As time went on, uh, if you weren't vaccinated, most people got it. So you became immune in some sense. But even more, most recently, there's still a five-fold difference between those who are unvaccinated and vaccinated uh, in terms of death. And so it's really, really important. If you look at, in the United States, this is a curve of the number of deaths over time. And you can see we were really, uh, in, a, in a terrible way until December 11, 2020, when the emergency use authorization was approved. And you can see uh, healthcare workers had it available, but it really wasn't available uh, but the FDA didn't approve it for everyone until April 19th, uh, 19, uh, 2021. And that was then approved for everyone over the age of 16. And the impact would, would have been very substantial. But if you look at this curve, there were a lot of people who still died who didn't need to. Because this, if you look at where the curve is later on when people are immune, either because they got it, survived and got it, or had vaccines, uh, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty uh, low. So there was a paper that looked from 530 to uh, 21 to from 9 to September 3rd, uh, 2022, and looked at the, there were 500,000, 500,908 deaths. Probably half could have been prevented uh, during this period. So total of 1 million folks as of March when they, Johns Hopkins started stop keeping data, as of uh, just last month, 1.2 uh, million. So you can see uh, there's still uh, about 80,000 people who, who have died uh, last year. So uh, still a significant problem. It's, there's still a lot of deaths happening because, people, uh, because it's a bad virus and people haven't been vaccinated. And probably half of the d deaths in the United States could have been prevented if people had just trusted their physicians or science and gotten vaccinated. So who can you trust, he asked. Uh, so there was an interesting study uh, by the Pew Research Center looking at confidence in scientists. And so it has dropped a little bit, but 76% of Americans still have a great deal of faith and in, in, in confidence in scientists. So we took a hit over the COVID pandemic, uh, but you know, it, it's, there's still a fair amount of, of confidence. And they looked at scientists are, are widely seen as intelligent, uh, skilled, working, uh, skilled at working in teams, honest, my favorite, though, is over half of them are considered socially awkward, and, the, and about half of them uh, are said to feel superior to others. If they, don't, if they think that, they're just stupid. <laughs> anyway, I like that. 
We feel superior to others. I don't know. Now, the, the only problem is that the, those are the characteristics of, phys, of scientists. The problem is only about half of the country wants scientists involved in making policy. So that, that's the disconnect. So we, we like scientists, we think they're smart, socially awkward, a little arrogant, uh, but we don't really, on, only half even want them involved with policy, and policy are things like vaccine policies. So, you know, the good news is that scientists and physicians are con still continue to be held in, in high regard in this country, but I'm not sure people really want to listen to them, so that's a, that's a, that's a problem. What's going on in the, uh, the world of respiratory disease is really bad. We're right, we're right in the middle of the, the sort of high respiratory disease season. You can look at uh, flu is extremely high. RSV is sort of moderate right now. And COVID, while it's present in wastewater quite high, there are not as many cases, which is interesting. And I think it's because we're getting uh, general immunity. So uh, we'll show you the data for uh, uh, percent emergency visits that are due to respiratory viruses. You can see flu is way up with RSV and COVID less so, and the percent of positive tests flew way up with RSV and COVID uh, less so. If you look at the, the, this year's uh, uh, influenza uh, season, it's, it's kind of interesting to look at it in the context. During the pandemic, there was almost no flu, and that's because people were st staying away from each other and wearing masks. Each year, it's gotten closer and closer, post-pandemic, closer and closer to pre-pandemic levels. And this season in red here, we're almost uh, paralleling exactly what the season flu, seasonal flu season was like uh, pre-pandemic. And if you look at wastewater, uh, it's a huge peak in influenza. And the only really good news is that the, the, mostly it's influenza A, the vast majority of that green is uh, influenza B, but the vast majority of influenza A, and the, when you sequence those influenza A's or subtype them, it's mostly H3N1, uh, that's in red, and in orange, uh, H1N1, both of which are in the vaccine. So if you get vaccinated, you're really very well protected from this seasonal flu. Well, what's the problem then? Well. This is non-medical exemptions in Texas. For, in other words, parents can just exempt their children from getting vaccinated for non-medical reasons. It goes up, 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 and you can see back in 2003, very rare. Now, I mean, it's, it's hundreds of thousands of medical exemptions. And I've shown you this before. Each year, we have less and less vaccinations done. So this red is the, this year, flu season again. Each year we're having fewer people get vaccinated against the flu. <laughs> so does that, who cares, right? Who cares? Well, I'll tell you who cares. Uh, there was this, a, a huge a surge in flu that shut down a North Texas school district near uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. So the Godly Independent uh, School District, which is in North Texas, shut down Wednesday, January 29th, because there were so many students that had the flu, 650 students, nearly one-fourth of its enrollment, more than 60 teachers. So that's what happens when you don't get vaccinated. You have schools closing. You remember how everybody was demanding, oh, I can't believe we've closed schools with COVID? Well, this is being closed because people aren't getting vaccinated. You know, what can I say? This is TEFI, my, my favorite little Texas, Texas Epidemic Public Health Institute that looks at all the wastewater in Texas. And what you can see is influenza, really huge peak. It's still peaking. RSV remains high, Parvo-19 is falling, and SARS-CoV-2 in Texas is kind of low, but nationally, it's quite high. Let me show you the level. It, nationally, it's considered to be quite high. It's coming down, but it's still pretty high. Uh, and if you look at emergency visits due to COVID, they peaked and are beginning to come down. And if you look at hospitalizations, uh, obviously during the pandemic, very high. And what's interesting to me is this the blue is this year, it's very low. So why is it, you know, still a lot of COVID around, very high in wastewater, so there's a lot of virus in people, but we're not having as many hospitalizations and people getting sick. It's a combination of the fact that almost everyone has either gotten COVID or have been vaccinated against it. So we have broad immunity against it. And the virus itself isn't changing very much. So this is, I've been showing this for months now, XCC is the dominant variant this year, and it's still the dominant variant, but it hasn't changed in percentage. It's, it's not really changing much. 
And if you look at the relatedness strains, they're all pretty closely related. So we haven't had some giant recombination event like Omicron or the one that came in through, uh, through Europe. If that happens, we'll probably have a big outbreak. But right now, with it staying pretty closely related, uh, I think you're seeing virus around, but people are quite resistant to it, and they're doing fine with it. That's a mild cold. It could change if the virus changes. It could change if we, over time, if we lose immunity to it. All right, so I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, congratulations to Dr. Ying Chen, a postdoc associate in the Department of Medicine, who is one of seven recipients of the American Liver Foundation uh, uh, Postdoctoral Research Fellowship Award. So that's, a, that's really great. Congratulations to Dr. Chen. And a shout out to Dr. Milan Dmitrijevich. I think I got it right. Uh, Professor Emeritus of Physical Medicine and Rehab, who is named the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award from Wings of Life, a nonprofit. Uh, that funds uh, spinal cord research. Uh, and you may know February is Heart Month, and I want to thank all our scientists and physicians who are part of the healthcare team trying to improve uh, the lives of people with heart disease and prevention. And then, of course, it's Super Bowl weekend. I couldn't care less about either team. Actually, I couldn't care less. Uh, so I, some will be watching the Super Bowl, but it won't be me. Anyway, the only thing I'm looking at this year is the commercials, I view it, there'll be a football game played in between commercials. I'll probably watch the commercials. Anyway, have a wonderful weekend, and uh, can't wait to see you next week.